Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. And if you want, you can use a meditation word along with the breath, put to, put in, to, out. It means awake. It's a quality of the mind we're trying to develop here. And notice how the breath feels, where you feel the breath. Because the breath isn't just the air coming in and out through the nose, it's the movement of the body that allows the air to come in go out. And as you get more and more sensitive to that movement, you realize that it affects the entire body, the entire nervous system, all the blood vessels, out to every pore. The more fully you're aware of that, the more you'll be grounded here in the present moment. If you can't be aware of the whole body all at once, try to see which parts you can be aware of. Go around the body and make a survey. Notice how the breathing feels in the stomach, how it feels in the chest, how it feels in the head. And then you go to the more subtle breathing, down in the back and the arms and the legs. Try to settle back into the breath. Be surrounded by the breath. This will keep you anchored here in the present moment, so you can see what's going on in the present moment, with a sense of well-being. Because the mind is constantly churning out ideas, churning out intentions, and you want to see that in action if you're going to be able to do something about it. And investing in these qualities, the qualities that you develop as you meditate, you're making a good investment. The Buddha himself makes a comparison between the practice and investment. You're investing your time in some important skills, the skills you need all the way through life. Because these are the things that are going to see you through, even as other aspects of your mind, aspects of your body begin to fall away. We got this body, we got this mind. It's like we signed on to some deal without reading the fine print. In the beginning, everything seems fine. When you're young, you find that you can do this that you couldn't do yesterday or that you couldn't do it last month, and there's something else you can do, and you find you, your abilities grow. Your command of language grows, your command of your body grows. You find you can do more and more things. And it seems like everything is just going to keep improving. Well, there reaches a point where things begin to plateau out. And before you realize that the plateau is beginning to erode away. Suddenly things you could do before you can't do. And the body doesn't warn you ahead of time. It doesn't say, okay, in five years your vision is going to get blurry, or in ten years you're going to have heart problems. It doesn't say anything. It just kind of up and does things. And so you have to be prepared for that. What are you going to depend on as your body begins to erode away? And as your mental capabilities begin to erode away? So if you've been developing qualities like mindfulness and alertness, concentration and discernment, You find you can deal with these problems with a lot more equanimity, with a lot more patience, and do your best to work around them. When the Buddha talks about things like inconstancy, stress, and not-self, he doesn't have you start out just by accepting them. He has you work against them. Can you make a state of mind that's constant? You go around talking about how inconstant the world is. Well, what about yourself? Your mind is even more inconstant. It's like the reflections on water. Can you make that water still so the reflections get still? Can you create a sense of ease in the body, an ease in the mind, to go against the stress? Can you get these things under your control so it's not totally not-self?
when you do, you'll learn a lot, both about what's constant and what's not, what's easeful and what's not, what you control and what you can't control. And then as the area that you can control begins to grow smaller, you still though, can appreciate what you've got left. There's a story in Thailand. There was a woman who had cancer, cancer in the bones, and she was going to go stay with a Jamahabua. He told her he couldn't look after her physically. All he could do was teach her the Dharma. So she took along a friend, an older woman who had been a doctor. And every evening they would go and listen to a Dharma talk from a John Mahabwa and record it. And then after the woman with cancer died, the friend came up with the idea of taking all those tapes and transcribing them. Even though her eyesight was beginning to fail and her strength was beginning to fail, she said she took heart from a teaching of a John Mahabwa that as your abilities begin to erode, focus on what you can do. If you focus on what you can't do, it gets suppressing. What good can you still do? There are lots of good things you can still do. And focus on those. Use your ingenuity in finding those things. It's the same principle as using your ingenuity and getting the mind to settle down. You take what seems inconstant, the mind's constantly irritated with this, irritated with that, and you make it steadier and with it, trying to develop a sense of ease and learn how to focus on that ease. A lot of people have trouble with this. One, because as things get easy, it's hard to keep a clear point as to where you're focused, and it's all too easy to get into that sense of pleasure and lose the breath. You can't drop the breath. You have to stay there. So it's important that you be able to make a distinction. Here's the breath, and the mind's focused on the breath, and there's the sense of ease. And the mind tends to gobble up the ease or wallow in it. It doesn't think too much. Once it gets it, it just likes to throw itself into the ease. You have to learn how to question it. What's this good for? What's the best way to relate to it? It's the same way with pains. We run away from the pains. The Buddha says, no, you want to question them. What is this thing called pain? When there's a pain in the body, why does it affect the mind? It seems to be a natural connection, but it's actually arbitrary. So learn how to question these these things that you take for granted. It's when you question them that you gain discernment. And you can get use out of the things that are stressful and constant, not self, and also use out of things that are more constant, easeful, more under your control. Learn how to make these distinctions. See what good you can get out of both sides. Because pain has its good side, you know. It's a good place for seeing all the little members of the community of your mind, the ones that tend to hide out and stay behind the scenes. If you sit with pain for a while, they're going to come up to the surface. And sometimes it's a little discouraging to see how your mind comments to itself on pain and the childish comments it makes. Why is this happening to me? Well, of course it's happening to you because you've got a body. Go around and find somebody out there who has a body who doesn't have pain. When these voices come to the surface, then you can you can deal with them. It's like that game whack a mole. I seem to have been gotten fixated on this game recently. The one where they have the, all the holes and these little moles come sticking up out of the holes randomly, and you hit them over the head with a plastic hammer. A lot of the moles in our minds tend to stay underground; they don't come up. But when pain comes, they're going to come to the surface. They're going to complain. And we tend to give in to them very easily. But if you learn how to have a little bit of firmness, a little bit of patience and endurance, 
a little bit of wisdom and asking questions about the pain and not taking it on as your pain. It's just a pain that's there. It's in the body. And you wonder, why is this happening to me? Well, you've got a body. Things happen to bodies. So take a more curious approach to it. Why is this happening? Why does this have to pain the mind? You find that a lot of it has to do with the labels you place on things. We tend to believe the labels we place on things because we've been using them all our lives. But it's good to call them into question. Like this idea of breath. We normally think of the breath simply as the air coming in and out of the lungs. But for centuries they've been talking about another kind of breath in the body. And it's good to try on those concepts to see where they help you deal with your body as you sense it from the inside. English has a very poor vocabulary for that. Our sciences are very good at describing the body from the outside, but can be measured from the outside, but how you experience it from within. We don't have that many words to describe it. So the Buddha talks about the, the solidity and the energy and the warmth and the coolness, the sense of space that surrounds the body. And that energy is related to the breath. To so try on the concepts and see what kind of questions they ask about you, about your sense of the body, and how you can use them to peel away any attachments, any unskillful ways of approaching your body or relating to the body, and relating to your mind. This way you can find that pleasure has its uses, pain has its uses. Physical limitations have their uses as well. You find yourself running up against your idea of a skill that you used to have, and all of a sudden it's going away. We tend to identify ourselves around our skills. The self is the producer, the part of, part of us is able to do things so we can have some pleasure. And those skills that we worked so hard to develop when we were small and as we grew up, we really identify around those. And then all of a sudden, this one goes and that one begins to deteriorate. How are you going to relate to that? Can you relate to that in good humor? Can you take a good lesson about non-attachment? And heed the lesson they tell you that if you want a happiness that's reliable, you have to find something that's not subject to change. And for that, you have to look in pretty deep. Well, the meditation allows you to do that as well by working with the breath, by trying to gain this sense of whole body awareness. You're really refining your discernment, because this is the kind of concentration that has to be just right. If things get too still in the mind, you blank out. If they're not still enough, you don't see things clearly. It's when you have this sense of just right that your discernment gets exercised, and then it can start seeing deeper and deeper and deeper into the mind. Subtle levels of attachment that are very flimsy, but very tenacious. Things you should never even noticed you had in your mind before, they begin to become clear. So we try to learn both from pleasure and from pain. So it refines our understanding of what our minds are doing. And we realize that even with the limitations that come to the body and come to the mind, we can still do good with what we got left. The important point is that when you discover okay, you lost a particular skill or a particular ability, you don't get too worked up about it. You just notice, oh, what have you got left? It's like when your portfolio gets wiped out by a stock market crash. 
look around and say, what have I got left? Hopefully you've got something that you've been investing in that doesn't have to go up and down with the stock market. You focus on that. And it's good to focus on that before things crash. This is what we're doing as we meditate. We're investing in the mind, we're investing in the quality of the mind's awareness in the present moment so that it can be our refuge when everything else begins to fail, to fall away. There's this still that we can hold on to. The deeper you go, the more solid it gets.